Hi everyone, welcome to Elvis Presley Past, Present and Future. So far on our Elvis journey, we've seen Elvis's young years, his teenage years, we've been with him through his school years, we've also seen him get his first job, we've seen him cut his first single, and we have seen him on the first time on stage. And last week, we saw him with his first album. So let's see where our journey is going to take us this week. Elvis had shown interest in becoming an actor before achieving major success as a singer. His first number one hit, Heartbreak Hotel, topped Billboard's Top 100 chart in April 1956, a few weeks after his screen test. He had worked as a cinema usher in his youth and would often watch his screen idols James Dean, Marlon Brando and Tony Curtis during his shifts. <clears throat> when he was watching them, he started watching them and he started learning how to be like them from watching their movies. When he first met his future manager, Colonel Parker, he expressed an interest in acting in films. In interviews during his rise to fame, Elvis would often talk about his hopes of attending somewhere like the actor's studio. He also insisted that he would not like to sing in any of his movies because he wished to be taken seriously as a film actor. However, Colonel Tom Parker had a plan to cross-promote Presley films with his music and this led to soundtracks being as important as if not more important than the scripts. Elvis' screen test for Hal Wallace on March 26, 1956 was at Paramount Studios. The test lasted three days and included Elvis performing two scenes from The Rainmaker and lip syncing to Blue Suede Shoes, as we saw in a previous video. Wallace's partner, Joe Hazen, commented, as a straight actor, this guy has great potential. His first screen test, a scene from the William Ng play The Girls of Summer, resulted in drama coach Charlotte Clary declaring to her class of students, now that is a natural born actor. On April 2, Hal Wallace offered Elvis a contract for one motion picture with options of six more. The contract was finalised on April 25 and also stipulated that Elvis was free to make at least one picture a year in other studios. Hal Wallace, who had produced classics like Casablanca, Little Caesar and the Maltese Falcon, had promised Elvis that he would look for dramatic roles to let the singer take his acting ability seriously. Wallace considered Elvis for a role in The Rat Race, a film about a naive, innocent boy who was struggling to make it as a musician in Manhattan. But he decided against it after another studio executive said, Elvis Presley just doesn't look like that. The film was eventually made in 1960 with Tony Curtis in the lead role. Another possible idea that Wallace mulled over was to pair Elvis with Jerry Lewis. Lewis had just separated from his comedy partner Dean Martin after a successful run of 17 movies together, but again the idea was shelved. On April 10, Elvis confidently announced during a radio interview that his debut feature would be The Rainmaker with Burt Lancaster and Katharine Hepburn. However, Despite this belief, and due to Wallace's being unable to find a project good enough for the debut of Elvis Presley, he was loaned out to 20th Century Fox on August 13 and began working on Love Me Tender. In its opening weekend, it shot to number two in Variety's list. Only James Dean's, films, only James Dean's film Giant had more viewers. 
It made back its production cost, approximately $1 million on its opening weekend. Of all the movies starring Elvis, this is the only one in which he didn't get top billing. He was billed third after Richard Egan and Deborah Padgett. The film was originally called The Reno Brothers, based on a story by Morris Garrity. Robert Buckner wrote the script to Dave Weishart, and Dave Weishart became a producer, with Robert D. Webb to direct it. In August 1956, Richard Egan signed to play the lead. Deborah Padgett was also signed before Elvis. Producer Wiesbert said, we signed Elvis for the younger brother at 100,000 when we heard he was available. The plot of the movie. Confederate soldiers led by Vance Reno, Richard Egan, rob a union train of its payroll money. But because the Civil War officially ended the day before their theft, it was not a legitimate act of war. Now an outlaw, Vance takes his share and heads home, where he intends to marry his fiancée, Kathy, Deborah Padgett. But upon arrival, he discovers that she has already married his younger brother, Clint Elvis. The troubled family tries to reconnect while also trying to evade the law. Elvis's role had originally been turned down by both Jeffrey Hunter and Robert Wagner because the part was too small. Elvis was reluctant to take the role after realising that his character died at the end. But he was persuaded to do it after he was told that the character's audiences were most likely to remember actors who had a tragic fate. By August 17, Fox denounced the four brothers would be played by James Drury, Cameron Mitchell, Elvis Presley and Egan. The New York Times Times called Presley's casting somewhere between fantasy and drama and said his next film would be for Paramount, The Lonesome Cowboy. William Campbell played another brother, Cameron Mitchell. The moment Elvis's casting was announced, Fox was deluged with queries about the film from Elvis fans. It was decided to expand his part and give him some songs to sing. Elvis arrived for filming with all of his lines learned as well as the lines of every other character as well. He found filming quite tasking and once commented to a friend that he had spent a whole day behind a team of mules. In little more than a month, Elvis had recorded all the songs for the film and had finished filming his scenes. Filming of the movie's climatic sequence, including the death scene of Elvis' character, took place at the Bell Moving Picture Ranch in the Santa Susana Mountains, west of the San Fernando Valley, on the outskirts of Los Angeles. The exact filming location, sometimes referred to among historians as the Rocky Hill, remained elusive for almost 60 years, until the site was discovered on an expedition by filming location researchers in early 2015. The researchers were able to locate the site by combining details from Love Me Tender. Bichard said during the shoot, Presley was humble, polite. He was cooperative, never late and very serious about acting. This was another kind of career for him. When Elvis appeared on The Ed Sullivan Show during a break in filming the movie on September 9, <clears throat> he performed Love Me Tender for the first time. Two weeks later, RCA confirmed that advanced sales of the single had resulted in it going gold before even being released. 
and industry first. It sold 1 million copies pre-ordered and ultimately ended up selling 2 million copies. On the 2nd of September, Fox announced the film's title would be changed from the Reno Brothers to Love Me Tender. I think he provides tremendous additional value in the role, said Wiesbach. He will surprise a lot of people who go to see him because his present presence isn't just a gimmick. Actually, he plays an acting part in a legitimate story and he does it very well. He sings, but the script is so constructed that the situations are logical when the family is together after the war or at a bazaar and picnic. There are folk tunes or hoedowns, except for the title piece a ballad. They all have Elvis rhythms. With his long brown hair and sideburns, he looks legitimate in terms of the period. Screen testings of the film resulted in people being upset at the death of Elvis's character. Attempting to reach a compromise between the death and pleasing his fans, Elvis filmed an extra scene and recorded an extra verse to the title track to be played over the end credits. Elvis attended a private screening of the film on November 20 at Lowe's State Theatre in Memphis prior to its national release. During this, during this private screening, Elvis's mother Gladys cried at the death of her son's character at the end, leading Elvis to insist that his characters would never die on screen again. <coughs> In its first week of release, the film grossed $540,000, number two at the box office for that week. Despite many critics giving it a lukewarm reception, a number of critics reviewed it in a positive light. The Los Angeles Times wrote, Elvis can act. The boy's really good, even when he isn't singing. Elvis would later express regret at making the film and was disappointed that the editions of songs had set up the future of his Hollywood career. Jerry Schilling recounts the atmosphere inside Lowe's Theatre in Memphis during that screening. The screams of the girls around me made it just about impossible to follow the story. This was the first time I'd seen an audience treat a film like it was a live concert, loudly responding to every move made and every word uttered by their favourite star. Elvis would later tell his friend Cliff Gleaves that he found this type of reaction from his cinema going fans embarrassing and that it had prevented him from being accepted as a serious actor. Deborah Paget was with Elvis Deborah Paget was Elvis Presley's first leading lady in his films. While Love Me Tender was Elvis's first film, it was Paget's 20th. Although she was only 17 months older than the 21-year-old Presley, she began her motion picture career at the age of 15. Deborah and Elvis met on The Milton Bell Show. Just months later, they starred together in Love Me Tender. Deborah was already a Hollywood star at that point. She was only 22 years old she truly became the look of the Elvis type. Deborah Paget born Deborah Lee Griffin on August 19, 1933. Was born in Denver, Colorado. One of five children born to Margaret Allen, a former actress, and Frank Henry Griffin, a painter. The family moved from Denver to Los Angeles, California in the 1930s to be close to the developing film industry. Paget was enrolled in the Hollywood Professional School when she was 11. Margaret was determined that Deborah and her siblings would also make their careers in show business. Deborah had her first professional job at the age of eight and acquired some stage experience at 13 when she acted in a 1946 production of Shakespeare's The Merry Wives of Windsor. Paramount Pictures borrowed her from 20th Century Fox for the part of Lilia, the water girl, 
in Cecil B. DeMille's Biblical Epic, The Ten Commandments, in 1956, alongside John Derrick. Her most successful film. She had to wear brown contact lenses to hide her blue eyes. She said that if it hadn't been for the lenses, I would not have gotten the part. However, she also said that the lenses were awful to work in because the lights heated them up. The film was a huge success, as was Paget Fox's western Love Me Tender, where Paget and Egan, Richard Egan, were both billed above Elvis. But it was the singer's popularity and charisma that made the film so successful. During production of Love Me Tender, Elvis became smitten with Deborah. At the time, however, she was romantically linked with Howard Hughes, and nothing came of the infatuation. A 1956 quoted Deborah's comments about Hughes. I was in love with Howard for two years, and I don't care who knows it. I was never alone with him in the whole two years. Mother was always with us. But I'll always remember Howard with great fondness. Deborah married actor and singer David Street on January 14, 1958. But she obtained a divorce on April 11, 1958. On March 27, 1960, she married Bud Bodiger, a prominent, a prominent director in Mexico. They separated just 22 days later and the divorce became final in 1961. Paget left the entertainment industry in 1964 after marrying Ling C. Kung on April 19, 1962. Kung was a Chinese American oil industry executive. Paget and Kung had one son, Jeffrey. Their marriage ended in divorce in 1960. Deborah added Elvis was a precious, humble, lovely person. He had a lot of talent. There was a lot of depth that he had that they never used. He could have been a fine actor. Deborah is still alive and he's 88 years old. September 3, 1956. Although his mother didn't drive, Elvis bought Gladys the now famous 1957 pink Cadillac. It was originally blue. Elvis had it painted pink. It remained at Graceland until Elvis died. Elvis changed the line in his song Baby Let's Play House from You May Get Religion to You May Get a Pink Cadillac. On September 5, Elvis was nicknamed Teen Angel by his fans. He admitted he liked teddy bears and paying taxes, which aroused the interest of the IRS, who started to investigate his income. Elvis now bought in $250,000 a week. He weighed 185 pounds, travelled by limousine and planes, slept no more than four hours a night, and didn't like snobby girls. And his song, Don't Be Cruel, reached number one on the billboards in the top 100 chart. The premiere of Love Me Tender was at Paramount Theatre on Broadway in, the, in New York City. Thousands of fans were outside the building on the night of the premiere. A huge paperboard with the image of Elvis covered up was on the outside of the building. It was covered until the day of the premiere. It was erected on October 8, 1956. The movie premiered on the 15th of November 1956. June Guanaco had met Elvis for the first time 
after one of his early concerts in Biloxi, when he was on the verge of superstardom. June said, Elvis was the love of my life. I met him when he was just a re regional star. I was 17, he was 20. He had been in my hometown of Biloxi, Mississippi several times before and people said you need to see him. So I went this one night. I thought he was the most gorgeous thing. Big, dreamy eyes. Girls were screaming over him and I'm just not that kind. I was passing by him not even looking at him and he reached through the crowd and grabbed my arm. He said, where are you going? What I remember most about that night was sitting in his car outside my house just talking while my mother kept an eye out to see what I was doing. The first thing I said was, what is your real name? I had never heard of a name like Elvis. And he said, what do you mean my real name? My name is Elvis Aaron Presley. We sat there until the sun come up at 6 a.m. He was shocked because my parents were divorced. He thought marriage was a lifelong thing. And when he got married, it was going to be forever. We got so wrapped up in kissing on our very first date. It was just marvellous. A little pecking here and there, a little nibble here and there, and then a serious bite. He was a magnificent kisser. He said, who taught you how to kiss? And I said, you know, I was getting ready to ask you the same thing. But I didn't hear from him for a while after that. It turned out he was calling and my older brother wasn't bothering to tell me. Finally, he said, some young guy with hillbilly accent called. For the one and a half years I dated him, our relationship remained chaste. He was just very tender and considerate. We spent so much time together and we started talking about marriage. Mrs. Presley liked me. She saw me as domestic and wise for my young years. She saw me as like another daughter. She was always telling me that Elvis needed someone to take care of him. But Elvis was becoming more famous and Colonel Parker wanted him linked with actresses and Vegas showgirls. Of course Elvis liked legs that went on for days and he bought one of those showgirls home for Christmas in 1956. That did it for me. I decided to marry someone else. And Elvis said the Colonel said we couldn't get married anyway. And Elvis said he wouldn't do that to the Colonel. A reporter rang up June's mother, Mrs. May Winarco, at her Biloxi home and asked about her daughter's relationship with Elvis. Mama said, when he's in Biloxi, he doesn't go out with any other girl but June. He said he can't get married for at least three years and he asked her to wait for him. Of course, no young woman who looks like June could be expected to wait around for three years for any man, not even Elvis. In 1957, after finishing work on his second movie, Loving You, Elvis wired June in Biloxi, asking her to meet him in New Orleans during his train's brief layover. There, in Elvis's private train car, she told him she was engaged to someone else. When the train pulled out, June wasn't on it. June says the next time I saw him was in a movie theatre in Memphis in the early 60s. I went down to the row behind him and tapped him on the back and he turned around, our eyes just locked. He got up, put me in a death grip. One of his guys ran over because he thought someone was abusing Elvis, but Elvis was holding on to me. Priscilla was sitting next to him and she was very gracious. She kept her eyes glued to the screen. In August 77, my mother was at my house. I had laid down for a nap. And when I came out of my bedroom, my mother was looking at me really strange. Finally, she said, June? She had tears in her eyes. She said, I just heard on the television that Elvis Presley has died. I looked at her and said, that can't be, Mama, that can't be. 
I went over to the television and turned it on and then fell to my knees in front of it. I couldn't breathe. I honestly think if my mother had not been with me, I might have died. In my heart, I always thought Elvis and I would be together somewhere down the road. I was married for 36 years and I've got two beautiful children and beautiful grandchildren. I've been blessed in many ways, but I have just not been able to stop loving Elvis. June wrote a book in 2012. It's called Elvis in the Twilight of Memory. The title is taken from Cahill Gebran's book, The Prophet. If in the twilight of memory we should meet once more, we shall speak again together and you shall sing to me a deeper song. It was a quote from the book. The book that June gave to Elvis in 1957 was found after his death on his bedside table at Graceland. It's still there to this day. The story behind Elvis' fear of flying is a strange one, mainly because he loved flying. Always traveling to Hawaii for concerts to take small trips here and there. It all started on this day in 1956. The plane that Elvis was on developed engine trouble and was forced to make an emergency landing. This moment is believed to have shaken him, giving him a fear of flying in his early career. April 11, 1956, Elvis, Elvis Presley's tour plane develops engine trouble while flying the singer from Amarillo, Texas to Nashville, forcing an emergency landing in Arkansas. When he calls his mother Gladys to tell her she begs him never to fly again, instilling a fear of flying in Elvis, which will take him years to get over. He took the flight with Sonny Moore and Bill Black to Nashville for a recording session. It was a terrifying flight. First of all, the pilot had to make an emergency landing in Arkansas due to low fuel. And when they eventually took off again, Scotty was in the co-pilot seat. He was asked by the pilot to hold the wheel while he looked for a map under the seat. Scotty said he didn't, didn't know how to fly a plane, but was told to just hold it. Yet the moment he did, both engines spluttered and quit. Scotty remembers as soon as that happened, the pilot reached over and threw a switch then took over the wheel. Both engines restarted, but it was enough to shake everybody a little bit. After we crossed the Mississippi River, we hit a bunch of turbulence. Scotty added, Bill turned white and put his coat over his head. I think he would have jumped if he could have gotten out. When we got to Nashville, Elvis eased up to us and said, we're not flying with this guy again. No matter where Elvis was going or what he was doing, the press was always on his heels. No wonder that he was captured when he ran out of gasoline one day. The mishap was, of course, noted by the press, and of course was worth an article in the Memphis Press on the 11th of December. The article said, Elvis, tank was empty, street full. The traffic tie-up in front of 72 Madison shortly after 1 p.m. today was Elvis Presley out of gas. Most embarrassing, that shiny brand new white Cadillac Eldorado he had bought just last week sputtered to a halt in front of the state savings bank. Quoting Mrs. Nancy McGee, assistant cashier at the state bank, the people started coming from everywhere. In no time at all, it looked like hundreds, maybe even thousands were there. They had the street blocked 
and four or five policemen were trying to keep the street clear, but the people came in from both sides of the street. They came from everywhere. The windows of all the buildings around were filled with people, craning their necks to see. The people just kept pouring out of the buildings. He must have signed a thousand autographs. An ambulance stopped. A novice went over and talked to the little girl inside. He was so awfully sweet. Finally, some policemen bought some gas. But it still took time for him to get out of the crowd. Running out of gas is not unusual with Elvis. He has a habit of keeping his motor running whenever he stops. And those big cars drink it fast. The year 1957 starts as successful as the previous year. Before making his third and final appearance on The Ed Sullivan Show, he had to fulfil a government obligation. Rumours had been circling, circulating that Elvis was going to be drafted. On January 4, he underwent the complete pre-induction physical at the Selective Service Headquarters, located at Kennedy's Veterans Hospital, which he passed. After receiving his draft number, he prepared to fly to New York for his final appearance on The Ed Sullivan Show, which was televised on January 6. On January 21, he started the work on his second movie, Loving You, which begins with the principal photography. It was the first movie Elvis made for producer Hal Wallace. It was developed by Wallace and writer-director Hal Cantor, specifically for the young star. Not only was this musical drama designed to showcase Elvis's best talents, but the storyline was rather ingeniously based on his own life. During this time, he began to dye his hair black. Now when they first moved to Audubon Drive, Elvis did not see any reason why fans couldn't come around the house. A lot of times he'd open the door and say, yeah, come on in. Then he changed his mind right quick. He glanced up at the window and there would be so many people with their noses pressed against the glass. He put up a wall, but they'd just jump over it. The neighbours starting, they started to get aggravated. They would come home and their drive would be blocked and kids in their yards trampling down their grass. The whole street was mad. They complained to the cops who put up a sign that said, no standing. The neighbours had a meeting. I went to Vernon and said, we want to buy your house. Vernon told Elvis. Elvis got so mad, he said, you go back and tell those S O B's, I'm going to buy all of their houses. But they came with a petition. That's when Elvis hired Billy Smith's dad as a gate guard. That's also when Gladys started getting sad. She couldn't take all of these people. And she really was upset with Elvis's fame. On Saturday, March 17, 1957, Vernon called local Memphis real estate agent Virginia Grant and asked her what properties she had that they could look at on behalf of their son Elvis. Grant showed two properties that day, leaving an estate called Graceland to last. By 6pm she had drawn up a provisional sales agreement for Vernon to sign and the deal was put in place for what has become the most famous home in music history. The agreement shows that it was put down a $10,000 deposit on the purchase of Graceland and the purchase price was a total of $102,500. 
this was ultimately made up of a $10,000 cash payment. The trade of the Presley's Audubon drive home for $55,000 and a mortgage over Graceland. Grayson was once a part of a 500 acre farm that was owned by the S.E. Tooth family. This picture was taken in 1941. The land had been part of the family for generations and was named after one of the female relatives, Grace. According to Grace in History 1939, Grace's niece, Ruth Brown Moore, and her husband, Dr. Thomas Moore, built the mansion, which became well known to the locals of Memphis. That's inside Graceland in 1939. The Moore's daughter, Ruth Marie, was musically accomplished and became a harpist with the Memphis, Memphis Symphony Orchestra. Classic recitals in the front formal rooms were common, just as rock and roll and gospel jam sessions would be with the next owner that moved in. So there we go. He's bought Graceland. Hope you enjoyed guys. Don't forget to subscribe, hit the like button, make your comments. Glad you could join us for this next video. We hope to see you next time. Take care. Bye.